All right, we have to go with a few coming in. And while they're coming in, we were in the book of Exodus, chapter 16. So there, there's your case up there. Exodus chapter 16 is where we were reading from last in our discussions. And we have been, of course, perusing the Old Testament and we have been paralleling it for using it along with our New Testament scriptures so that we can put together a whole picture that God has, the message of God, so that we can see that one is not disconnected from the other, that they are both from the same God and how that one eliminates the other and they build off of one another. Last week, we started out with the Psalms 119 and uh, 30, where it says the entrance of thy word give us light. And from that, we know that the writer of the Psalms is trying to share with us that the entrance of God's word into our lives brings light into our path, brings light into our souls. And that light that God gives us is the information we need in order to serve him according to his will and according to his purpose. And therefore, if we allow the light into us, then we can see where in this New Testament scripture, where it says, let this mind be in you, how it all starts to come together as one cohesive story, as one cohesive set of instructions that God has given to all men to serve him. Okay. Let's see. We're still in chapter 16. I'm going to try to finish up with 16 and get into 17. And then hopefully by the time we get there, we can then make some larger leaps. But I've just been trying to take our time in the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, their interaction with God, and then still pointing out how that God is being patient with them, even though he, they are testing his patience. They are uh, largely being disobedient. There are some that are obedient to the word of God. Just like in today, there are people who are obedient to the word of God, and there's those that are not. And those that are not, of course, are not in God's favor, but those that are, are in God's favor, or they live in God's right, God's right ways. So as we continue to look at these things, we can put together what is pleasing and acceptable to God and make sure that we can tailor our lives to be pleasing and acceptable to God. All right, so let's have an opening word of prayer and then we'll continue our discussion and reading. Let us pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Almighty God, for your kindness that you have shown to all men, for your blessings and mercy in all the lives that are here upon the earth. For we know, O oh God, that you move through all and that you own all that is upon the earth. Let our awe and spectacle of you be always in our hearts. Let our minds grow with the love and understanding that you give through your word. May you illuminate your words within our hearts that it may grow and bring forth the fruit that is pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay, so as we looked at the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt, again, most of the stuff we're very, very familiar with and how that they you know, were without water and without food and how they were seemingly angry with Moses all the time because they say, well, you brought us out of Egypt. Well, you did this to us. You brought us out here to die. Not necessarily thinking past that it was not Moses who brought them out of Egypt. They seem to forget that part. And they seem to not remember the things that God had done for them in bringing them out of Egypt. He showed them who he is. He showed them his power and his might and what he is able and capable of doing, but they seem to be not capable or able of remembering. That seems to always slip their, their mind. And when I say there, and I'm always, there's always a remnant or a small section of people within the children of Israel. God never puts a number to it or anything, but there are those that do follow, that do obey. So we have to, I, I want to highlight that from time to time, because sometimes it seemed like they were just all this and they were all, and, it, and it's not the case. They were always, always those that were doing what God said, but unfortunately they had to suffer for those who did not. And that was one of those things I had to 
get a grip on the first time when I went to boot camp. And mm. you know, you're doing what you're supposed to do, and there's other people in like not doing what they're supposed to do, but guess what? You get cycled too. And it's like, but I did you're one. I'm not. <laughs> but because you're one, then you suffer along with them. It took me a while to breathe that in. But then also, what it motivated me to do was talk to those that weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Try to encourage them and to show them, be that example to them. Okay. So, therefore, helping them, and that's what we were reading in Galatians on Thursday night about helping one another and sharing and caring with one another. So, as you see, some of the what's the thing called? The thoughts and threads of life go throughout the entire portion of the scriptures. It's not just for one section or another, or they're not connected. Because spiritually, it's all connected, one with another. Okay? Let's see. In verse 11, it says, and Moses, yeah, and the Lord said to Moses, the outcry of the children of Israel have come to my ears. Say to them now, I'm reading from the Bible in basic English this morning. <laughs> At nightfall, I will have meat for your food, and in the morning, bread in full measure, and you will see that I am the Lord your God. Now, when this occurs, they're two months out from coming out of Egypt, and they are, of course, hungry, and they need something to eat. And so God is going to supply to them in full something to eat. Both bread and quail is what he's going to provide for them. And he tells them what measure that they should take up. But he does this to tempt them to see if they're going to obey him. And some of them do, and some of them don't. Now, yes, sir. Uh, what other scripture are you in? Exodus? I'm in Exodus chapter 16. I read verse 11 and 12. It's not working. Okay, so this is larger. So reading up down through 20. We can see how that says on um, verse 21, where it says, On the sixth day, they took up twice as much of the bread, two omers for every person, and all the rulers of the people gave Moses word of it. Verse 23, and he said, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the day of rest. A holy Sabbath to the Lord. What has to be cooked may be cooked, and what is over put on the side to be kept until the morning. Now, if you remember, when he told them to go out that day to only get what they could eat for that day and not to save any, those that picked more than they were supposed to, more than they could eat, well, when they tried to save it for the next day, what happened? Oh. It's spoiled. It had one thing, so God blew it away. And that's what uh, we read in the New Alive. So, because he, he didn't want them to keep it, so therefore he made it where it would not last and that it would be diminished to not be eaten. But here, when it's coming up on the seventh day, he's telling him to set aside and that it will last. And so they kept it, and then they were able to not have to do any work, but what happened? Let's see, we're down to verse 25. Now, okay, starting with verse 25. And Moses said, make your meal today and what you have for this day is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not get any in the field. For six days will you get it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, there will be, there will not be any. But still, on the seventh day, some of the people went out to get it. And there, and, <laughs> and there was not any. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you go against my orders and my laws? 
So some people, again, did what God had said to do, was to not go out. But then you had those that were disobedient and went out anyway because they wanted to either check to make sure, like, mm, I'm going anyway. I'm going to see what's out there. Uh, is it real or not? Doubts in the mind. We're in Exodus chapter 16 and around verses 26. For those who just came in. Does that mirror anything in our lives now? Is it something that we do in not following God's instruction because we don't think it's going to work out? Or I didn't get enough. I didn't get what I wanted. I didn't get all that I thought I should have. We have those thoughts sometimes. But then, are we, and can you come up with a parallel on this in the New Testament? When God has given to us, because God has blessed each and every one of us immensely, for whatever it is, wherever we are in life, he has blessed us with what we have. Are we thankful for what we do have? Do we honestly appreciate what it is that I have in God? Because I have learned I can't have any more than he gives me. Just like here, they were trying to have more than what God was going to give them. God said, this is what I want you to have. It is sufficient. Am I finding in life where I don't find what God has given me sufficient? Where I think he should be giving me more than what I currently have. So therefore, not appreciating where I am, wherever that is, in life. I talked to somebody one time, and it's interesting how people will summate some your life for you. Because they meet you, and everybody does this. You kind of summarize who you're talking to. And people see what you have and what you're doing, and then they think, certain things about you, here goes. Now, just for reference sake, most people know that I drive a Tesla, okay? I have driven other vehicles before then. I had a Montero, I found like a 2000 Montero at one time. And I met somebody, I, I picked up and was taking somewhere. And I kind of, it was a stranger to me, but I wanted to ask them about what did they think of me? Kind of, not in those exact words, but just probing because I like testing people, see what they think, how they think. And the person after they met me, they said, well, you were probably born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Okay. And because, you know, they're looking at what I have and what I'm what we're driving, and they make assumption of what my life had to be like in order for me to have what I have. And which was very far from the truth. Because where I'm going with this is that I think back on all the hoopties that I've driven before getting here. All the beater heaters, but a beater or beater with a heater that I'm driven. Okay. <laughs> that was just to get me from point A to point B. And then in the course of life, God has blessed me to have more. Did I seek after more? Sure, I did. But did I curse what I had at the time I had it? Sometimes I did, but in the process of time, in the process of learning about God, I learned to appreciate whatever I was driving for whatever period of time I was driving it. But when people look at me now, they think that I've never gone through anything. I've never suffered anything. Which is, of course, everybody knows, if you think about your own life, we all suffer something, right? We all go through something. But unfortunately, people don't always project that onto other people. And recently, you know, that's not going to So it's interesting how that they were told what to do and when to do it and how to do it. And God does that even throughout his word. He tells us when to do, how to do, and what to do. But then we have to choose whether we do it or not. Brother Kelly. And I think that's yeah. important uh, as we go about, you know, sharing God's word. Um, the world looks at us that, that way as well. And, 
through things. So we just share our struggles mm -hmm. um, when we share our victories. But a lot of times we, we, we don't share the struggles for the world. It's hard for them to connect uh, to the victories. Mm -hmm. It's kind of showing us off. So that's a good point. Senator Champion corrected me last week. So I'm going to try to change something I said. It's just like, what did he say? <laughs> okay, so here goes. Because last week I was talking about finance and how the, I don't check my bank account, my tech account, tech account balance. I might look at it once a quarter, <laughs> if that much. But she told me I needed to change what I said this way. I don't look at it because. I trust in God. When I realize that what I have comes from Him, hope I'm going to say this right now, then the, the money, there's money there. And I trust that there's money there because God gave me work to do. He gives me enough work, and I should be a good steward over what He has given me. Okay? So I don't frivolously spend what's there because I know what's there or thereabout. I have a good sense of I know what's in there. And I'm usually close. So I know if I go out and work for the week and I add up all my tickets, then the right brother you add up all your tickets, you kind of know what you should have coming in, right? It's just like anybody who gets a paycheck. You get a paycheck, you know what you should have coming in. Then why am I going to be looking at it all the time? Because if you spend more than you take in, then you're going to get in trouble, right? But God gave us all the good sense to know that I can't spend more than I made. That's the that's question. <laughs> okay. But if I don't spend more than I take in, then what am I worried about? I haven't bounced a check in years. And man, I had to think that was in my mid 20s last time I bounced a check. Okay. And, but why is that? It's because I know what it gives me, I know what my limits are. Just like he gave them limits here. So when you gave them limits and then they choose not to adhere to the limits, then we're going to work right. So do that. But if we know what the limits are and we follow the limits that are given, then things go right. Right. So it's not that it was magic that God just puts money in my account and there it is, I'm just spending it. That's not the projection that I meant. It meant that I know He provides. I live within what he provides me, and there's always sufficiency there. Isn't that what we say every Sunday morning when we take the Lord's Supper and when we do the collection? That we should have sufficiency in all things. So therefore, making sure that I am a good steward of what he gives me, that therefore I don't have to check because I trust that he supplies to me what I need. Just like here with the children of Israel, he supplied to them what they needed. Although sometimes some of them tried to go beyond what was needed, what they had, what they needed to survive. And sometimes that's still a struggle to live in, live in what God has supplied. Yes, sir. I have trouble sometimes agreeing with what you say and, and what other people say about what people think. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I learned yesterday, I was talking to a brother that needed counseling. And I recommended you, uh, Brother Bryson. And the brother told me he, he can't talk to Bryce because Bryce ain't never been through nothing. You <laughs> <laughs> too young. You too young. He can't talk to Bryce. He can look at Bryce and tell him he ain't never been through nothing. He told me that you do everything in the church. You know, why do we work you like a slave? So I'm thinking, uh, where is this coming from? So I do believe now that people can, like you say, look at you and come up with a conclusion of their own, mm -hmm. which can be so far from what the reality is. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah, and I'm not saying Brace of do it something. I'm not saying that. You do all the work in the church. I'm just saying this is what's his perception. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what I was going to leave alone. Great <laughs> again.
when we when we are looking, when we are assessing, is by what lens are we looking at the world? By what lens are we assessing what we're assessing? And sometimes the assessments can be totally and totally wrong. But that's why we should lean to God and also lean to the the ways that He has put within His words for us to know, because we can know the at least some of the the plights of men, let's put it that way, by what God has shared with us. Okay, I'm gonna read back through the right Yes, sir. Just to just to um, make sure that we understand. You know our perspective um even in matthew eleven twenty nine, 29 jesus says take my yoke upon you and then he says and learn it mm -hmm. so in order to know people you have to learn them mm -hmm. you cannot look at anyone and presume and presume that you know them that is a total possibility because we cannot read each other's hearts, right? We do not have that power. So even in relationship with God, what he tells us to do, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. Here's what he wants you to know about him. But here's where oftentimes many of us don't lie. He says, or, um, or we don't decide. Um, uh, he says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Verse 30 is where what a lot of people won't agree with. He says, my yoke is easy mm -hmm. and my burden is light. Right. He said, if you really know me, you will come to conclude that. But many people don't think that uh, Jesus' yoke is easy, going where he goes, doing what he does, uh, the way in which he does it. And that what he is asking of us is light, it's easy, it's simple. Um, and that's because we don't know him or see him as he should be seen. So if we have difficulty doing that between us and God, we automatically have that same difficulty between man and man. And that's why I constantly say between the relationship that man and God has Whatever we don't do for God, we don't do for each other. We can't, whatever we can't do for God, we can't do for one another. It's impossible to love God and then hate your brother, right? If I love God, then God teaches me how to love everyone else. And so, and, and then in order to love everyone else, and we think we do this well in the flesh, but the reality of this is that God is love. <clears throat> So if you don't know God, you actually don't know what love is, right? We have created a facility, um, a, 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 a pseudo effect of what love is, you know, particularly pleasing people. Oh, give me this, do this for me, and then you love me. It's false narrative. And much of the world has bought into that. So much so that if people don't do those things, Right. And you feel as though they don't love you. And that's false. Mm. Let's do this. Let's pick up our reading at verse 31. Thanks for the credit. At verse 31, 1631. We're getting to the end of this chapter. I'm going to take this and parallel it to the New Testament. Okay. So it says, Again, and this bread was named manna by Israel. So Israel gave the name to the bread that they were getting from God. They called it manna. It was like it was white, like a grain seed, and it tastes like little cakes made with honey. As most and Moses said, this is the order which God had given. Let one owner of it be kept. For future generations, so that they may see the bread which I gave you for your food in the wasteland, when I took you out of out of out from in the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put one homer of manna in it, and put it always before the Lord to be kept for future generations. So Aaron put it in front of the holy chest 
to be kept. As the Lord gave orders to Moses, the children of Israel had manna for their food for 40, for 40 years till they came to the land with people in it, till they came to the edge of the land of Canaan. Now, go with me to uh -oh, John chapter 6. I'm going to skip through John chapter 6. So John chapter 6, and let's skip down to verses 33. God said, God's bread is the man who came up. Oh, sorry, I said 33 tonight. Mm -hmm. Let's try that again. Back up to verse 32. Jesus said to them, I can guarantee this truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my father gave you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33. God's bread is the man who came down from heaven and gives life to the world. Drop down to verse 40. The Jews began to criticize Jesus and said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. This is the bread that, I'm at verse 50 now, skip. This is the bread that comes from heaven so that whoever eats it won't die. I am the living bread that came from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread I will give you, will give to bring life to the world is my flesh. Verse 48, I mean 58. This is the bread that came from heaven. It is not the bread like the bread your father answers to be. They eventually die. Those who eat this bread will live forever. So in pulling those out, pulling that together, we have a contrast. What they were going through in the wilderness was spiritual. They did not see it as spiritual, but that bread of life that came from heaven for them because it provided them with physical life. But now we have that bread from heaven which is spiritual life that is given through Christ Jesus. Whereas the writer John was illuminating to his readers, those that were of the Jewish nation, that yes, for 40 years God provided bread for your fathers, but now he has sent the true bread from heaven, which is Jesus' the Son, to give his flesh for all men, because remember God's decree and God's hope is for all men to be saved, and so therefore that's why he sent his Son into the world, that those who believe on him might be saved. Alright, so those are thoughts that we can take with us. I'm not going to go into a lot, of, a lot on that one way or the other. But seeing that they were given manna, we are given a manna as well, but the bread that was heaven for us is Jesus. And how that we partake of it every Lord's day is so that we may have life in us. And without partaking of it, we do not have that life in us that God is talking about to have. Let's see. I'm trying to see. Get back to the gallery. Ten minutes and go back to my notes right there. One of the things that I was looking at is when the in verse in chapter 17, I'm gonna kind of talk about this rather than read it. Uh, remember in chapter 17, they're still after water, they still need water to drink, they keep traveling, and their their focus is on, of course, not having food to eat, not having water to drink. Well, now they have food to eat daily. And now they need water, and water always becomes scarce because they're traveling through a desert area. And somewhere in chapter 17, it says, And they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Can somebody find that for me? I didn't write down where that was located. And they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. 16.10 Okay. Let's take the Exodus 16. So it's chapter 16, verse 10. Let's pick up.
take that apart just a little bit. What happened? What came before that? Um, Moses was telling them to come before the Lord because he heard them grumbling. Okay. Can, can you read two verses before that and come back for me? Whatever makes the paragraph sense. Um, then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Okay. Think about it a moment. Where do they have to go? Well, the promised land, I think somebody said that. Okay. Where is the promised land? Canaan. Canaan, okay. What's between Canaan and where they are? Wilderness. Okay. Wilderness, desert area. So they have to travel through this desert area to get to the land that God had promised them, right? promised their forefathers. It was their destination, but they had a journey. They were looking towards the wilderness, and what did they see? Well, it says, uh, what does it say? Do you repeat what it says. <laughs> Come on, work with them. They, they saw the glory of the Lord. It appeared in the cloud, right? Okay. Let me make it clear. Sometimes in life, you have to look past where you got to go to where you want to be. But know this. God is in that journey with you. Because when they looked, they could behold the glory of the Lord in over the wilderness, right? So they weren't traveling alone. They weren't traveling without God, but by His grace and by His mercy, they would be traveling with Him. And so where was He? In the wilderness, waiting on them. One of the things I've learned in life is that instead of running from problems, because sometimes you can see trouble coming mm -hmm. and try to avoid it. But our strength is not gathered by running around it or running from it, but actually going through it. That endurance that the scriptures ask us to get comes from going through something. Right? So here we have that spiritual representation in the children of Israel having to go through the wilderness, but God is with them. He shows them his presence. When we have those spiritual eyes that God has given us, then we can see him even in our times of trouble. What seems like it should be despair, oh man, it doesn't have to be. Because who is with me? Whom shall save me? Can we remember what God has done and what God will do? As here, when they're looking forward, they're not looking, I'm going to say, they're not looking with the joy of going through this. Now, granted, the test of life doesn't always come out as joyous. They don't. But the joy comes from making it through. Because when I finally stopped running away and whatever that problem I needed to face, I faced it with the Word of God in me and with me, that I was able to endure the test, the trial, and get to the other side. And guess what? Yes, there is another side. And yes, there is joy in the morning when you get to the other side of that. Because who is it that was with me? Who is it that sustained me? Who is it that I'm giving credit to passing through the troubles of life? Because one of the most tumultuous times that I had was with my one of my houses. And I had gone through the, the process of putting together a loan modification. You know, somehow I don't, might remember those things. I had gone through it too. And I did everything that they said to do. 
And I had made all my payments as they said to have made them. But the one thing that I did not catch that they did not tell you, tell me, is that even though I was making payments, I was getting further and further behind because it wasn't the entire payment. And they don't tell you that. It is in there, but they don't tell you. And so they came back a year later and said, okay, now you got to catch up. Like, what do you mean? I thought I'd been paying you. And I said, no, you have this lump sum now that's behind. I tell you, I didn't have it. Now, granted, that was one of those times I had to humble myself because I'm one of those people that don't necessarily tell other people I'm in trouble or I need help. And so I had to humble myself to come to the church and ask for help. And when I did, now granted, I was given the help that I was asked for, and the, the payment was made because it wasn't, it, now, I'm going to say it this way, it was only $2,000, but I didn't have it. So $2,000 could have been $2 million, it didn't matter, I didn't have it. But once that was satisfied, everything got corrected. And once everything got corrected, every, the ship was righted. So therefore, me humbling myself in order, and going to ask for help, presenting myself and saying, hey, this is the situation I'm in, and I was given the help that was necessary, here's the sad thing that happened to me. On the other side of that, I was grateful that we were able to get everything together. I still had to sell my home eventually. I still had to sell my home. But uh, in the process of selling my home, I also ended up buying a new vehicle too which looked weird to other people because they said, well, I thought you said you needed help. I said, I did. But it was a group of circumstances that I really had little control over because at the same time I needed help to get the house straightened out and fixed, I needed transportation too. Well, it all worked out in the process of time, and I can, I can assure you, it wasn't just because of what Sherwin thought of and what Sherwin could do. It was the glory of God that made all these things line up and work together for my good. So just because something looks awful going in doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever and that there is a bright side on the other side of it that we can look forward to. If we just hold on, we don't have to see it. Now granted, I'm speaking of something in the past, but a lot of times people are trying to see what's, happen what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen next week. We don't know. That's where our walk with God becomes that faith that he talks about. I don't have to see because I know who I'm walking with. Such as the children of Israel, they didn't have to see where they were going or even know more than what God was telling them because of who was with them. So in our lives, we have that opportunity to exercise faith and truth and love because of the knowledge, right? Because it says, add to your faith what? Knowledge. And knowledge comes from what we read in the scriptures and then retain, okay? I'm gonna add that to it. Not just reading, but we have to retain what we read. Wisdom. Use that which you remember that is there. You have to make it a conscious effort to remember what is there, and at the appropriate time, use it. That's where patience and comfort of the scripture gives us hope. Does this all fit together? Okay. Well, thank you. Let's see. Next week, we're going to try to get through chapter 17. We're out of time right at the moment. And as we, as you continue to look at it, look backward, I mean, look forward to through the New Testament and see where God illuminates what was done in the Old Testament as a physical act has a spiritual act for us in the New Testament as well. And that's what we'll continue to do. I think we're, because what I'm trying to do is get to Mount Sinai. I haven't gotten there yet, but that's where I'm looking forward to. I want to get to Mount Sinai, where God comes down and talks to the children of Israel. So if you're doing the reading, that's where I'm trying to get to. Thank you, everybody. Let's have a closing word of prayer and we'll be dismissed for this morning's worship. Let us pray. To our Lord and our God above, we thank you for your words that you've given to us, your words that are able to illuminate our souls and bring nourishment to the inner man, that allows us to grow and to live 
a life before you that is pleasing and acceptable. Let our hearts grow, knowing, O oh God, that you are the supplier of all love, and we do not have to run out, that we are ever supplied with all that we need in order to give to those that are around us in every possible way. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.